to the seventh uh, webinar in our series, uh, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, uh, co-organized by the Center for Religious Studies and the Center for Information and Communication Technologies of uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Trent. Uh, today's speaker is um, Professor Krüger from the University of Fribourg. Um, uh, the meeting will be uh, chaired by uh, my colleague Margherita Galassini and she will introduce Professor Krüger shortly. Let me just remind you that we uh, record this webinar. So if you do not want to be recorded, uh, please uh, mute your microphones and switch off your cameras. Um, so um, just to remind you of that. Um, Anyway, please keep your microphones muted and your cameras uh, switched off during uh, Professor Krüger's presentation, just to save uh, bandwidth. Um, yeah, that's it from my uh, part. For now, I'd like to give the floor to Margarita. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boris. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I can actually hear the sound of my voice. No, I think now it's fine. Okay, um, I could hear like an echo, but. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, chair today's webinar um, and to warmly welcome our, our speaker, Oliver Kruger, uh, who's Professor for Religious Studies at Fribourg University in Switzerland. Um, after finishing his PhD at the University of Bonn, he did research at Heidelberg and Princeton University. He specialized in the relation of media, science and religion. Among his major publications, um, there is a a forthcoming book in May 2021. Um, the English translation is Virtual Immortality, God, Evolution and the Singularity in Post and Transhumanism, published by Transcript. Uh, the German version of this book uh, is already available. It was published in 2019. Um, another book published um, with Biel Bielfeld in 2012, um, I'm going to um, say the English rough translation, because I can't uh, speak Ger German, unfortunately. Um, media religion, problems and perspectives of media research in religious studies and sociology of knowledge. The title of Oliver's presentation today is God, the Singularity and the Transcendent Superintelligence, Philosophical Context of the Transhumanist Utopia. Oliver, I would like to let you know that our director, uh, Professor Marco Ventura, apologizes for not being able to be here with us today, and he sends you his warmest regards. Um, now, without further ado, Oliver, you will have about 25 minutes for your presentation, and we'll then keep ourselves 25 minutes for the discussion. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thank you very much for your kind invitation to Trento, which I would have loved to really explore and for the kind introduction here. So I think first I have to share my screen. So you can see and hear me. Does it work? Yes, perfect. Yeah. OK, so thank you very much. I think it's quite a challenge now to speak for only 25 minutes on a topic which I research for more than 20 years now. On the one hand, I think it's now only a scratching on the surface, but of course, on the other hand, I try to give you an idea on post-humanism and transhumanism in the context of religion, figuring as a kind of stimulus for our discussion here on computer in relation to artificial intelligence. So I try to introduce my talk with a motto established by John Bailey, one of the first researchers um, focusing on the history and the philosophy of progress, mainly in the 18th century. That was John Bailey. Observed progress is mainly technical, whereas believed progress is mainly spiritual. And we will see, although this quote was many decades before post post-humanism came up, how true this will be. So what do I present today? I will introduce you to the concepts of technological and critical post-humanism and transhumanism, just to clarify on what I'm talking. And then I will focus on the main thinkers and ideas of the so-called technological post-humanism. 
After that, we will enter the main topic of our lecture today, the singularity and the transcendental super intelligence. So, technological posthumanism started in the 1980s with the seminal work of Hans Mororek, uh, an American roboticist, with his book Mind Children, the Future of Robot and Human Intelligence, where he proclaimed that the human race will, in a few decades, be being overcome by technology, by post-biological artificial life forms, so that are mainly robots and artificial intelligences. We have to differ from this technological posthumanism, the so-called critical posthumanism. They both develop parallelly, and so within the last 10, 15 years, it's quite reasonable to differ the two. Because here, the posthumanism, the technological posthumanism, wants to overcome the biological humanity by um, their technological progeny. And here, in the critical posthumanism, that is a posthumanism. So they criticize the ideals of humanism, which were established in the Renaissance and which, were, which are so Eurocentric or so focused on the Western Hemisphere and Androcentric. So this approach is very feminist, framed mainly by post-structuralist post approaches. Main proponents here, which many of you will know, are Donna Haraway and Rosie Bradotti. So I don't talk on critical posthumanism, but on the technological posthumanism. That's a technological utopia. So I do not talk, and they do not deal with actual artificial intelligence research. They speculate on possibilities and prospects of future artificial intelligence. And they are more or less linked to actual artificial intelligence research. So, and the third term we have to deal with is transhumanism. I think there are two reasons to differ between transhumanism and posthumanism. One focuses on the contents. So that means in transhumanism, they propagate an augmentation of human abilities by technology. So by genetics, by becoming cyborgs, by certain diet movements with which you could reach uh, an age of 100 to 150 years. Then in the Californian transhumanism, we have bodybuilding movements and the, program, the uh, selling of smart drugs. While in posthumanism, uh, we the focus is on technology and in transhumanism as a wider, broader movement, it's more on the human being. And the second reason to differ the two is why posthumanism st starts in the 1980s, transhumanism starts already in the 1960s, linked to um, figures like Timothy Leary and FM 2000. 30 and others. So the core idea of posthumanism is to link this overcoming of the human race with the prospect of immortality. I quote Hans Moravec here from his seminal book of 1988, Mind Children, where he envisions the procedure on of technological transmigration. So how to make man, human beings, immortal by technology. I quote here. The robot surgeon opens your brain case and places a hand on the brain surface. In the final disorientating step, the surgeon lifts out his hand. 
Your suddenly abandoned body goes into spasms and dies. For a moment you experience only quiet and dark. Then once again you can open your eyes. Your metamorphosis is complete. And your future being is then, of course, not, a, not incorporated in a biological body, but stored on a computer disk. Of course, this idea existed before Mororek's book. It had existed since the late 1950s in science fiction stories like Arthur C. Clarke's The City and the Stars, or philosophically it is uh, considered in Stanislaw Lem's Dialogi, so the possibilities of uh, technological immortalization procedures, and uh, described with many details in Boris and Arkady's Strugatsky's Candles Before the Control Board, where a genius, a professor, of course, wants to become immortal by scanning his brain into a supercomputer. And today, these ideas are so popular that in, in every second Netflix series, you find the one or the other way of technological immortality here and most famously in movies like Transcendence of 2014 or in the current Netflix series, Altered Carbon. Oh, one second. Yeah. So beside Hans Mörwerk, who are the main proponents here, I, I want to introduce here only to Frank Tipler. Uh, physicist and cosmologist of Tulane University in New Orleans, and the well-known Ray Kurzweil, who published a lot of um, technological utopian books like The Age of Spiritual Machines and the most famous one, The Singularity is Near of the Year 2000, where he offers some prognosis of future technological development and the singularity is near is near is much more than his um, earlier books he enters a fusion of philosophy and uh, technological prophecies here and he was also one of the main figures to start the so-called singularity summits and the singularity university of 2000 eight which is not a university at all and it also doesn't deal with the singularity but only with um it's a kind of of marketing place for future technologies and to organize summits to bring uh future and current leaders of the digital economy together to exchange ideas Oliver, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I don't know um, if maybe you switched off your camera by mistake, but I can no longer see you. Oh, I don't see slides though. Oh, but then I have to. Okay, now now I can see you. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please. Oh. Yeah, but I didn't change anything, so I have to re-enter here. Yeah. So, what is in the core of posthumanist? philosophy, immortality on the one hand, on the other hand, the replacement of the human being. But why should human beings be replaced? The literary scholar Anne Catherine Hales wrote a book, How We Became Post-Human in 1999. And here she proposed the idea that we are already post-human. Why? Why can we be already be post-human, although that are future utopias? Yeah, we are already post-human by definition. Human beings are defined as intelligent machines since the 19 cybernetic th theory since the 1950s. I quote Frank Tipler here. I therefore regard a human being as nothing but a particular type of machine. The human brain is nothing but an information processing device. The human soul is nothing but a program being run on a computer called 
the brain. And so we can enter the comparison between human beings as information processing machines and real computers. So the result is that human beings are quite inefficient. They are slowly and they have only uh, limited abilities to store information. And this storage is not very reliable. So there's a, that there are many reasons for replacing humanity because artificial intelligence computers appear to be more efficient. And if we go back to history and progress theory in the 18th century, we can see that here ideals of the Enlightenment are reflected. Progress is measured by three elements, mainly with the most of the, th of the thinkers. Here, this is an increase in knowledge, an increase in work. So that would correspond directly to these categories uh, in cybernetic theory. And the third element is the increase in moral. Of course, posthumanism lacks of this element here in their progress theory. Now we come to the next crucial idea here, which became so prominent in the 2000s. At the year 2000, I uh, already thought, uh, in the year 2010, I already thought the, the time of transhumanism is over. But then came uh, Ray Kurzweil with his book, The Singularity is Near, and the movies on his person, on the singularity and uh, the foundation of the singularity university. And so the discussion on transhumanism on the singularity was fueled again. And I would like to introduce a little bit to the two aspects of the singularity which merged together in posthumanism. This is the cosmological and the technological singularity. So how Ray Kurzweil succeeded to introduce this concept in this transhumanist discourse with a very detailed prophecy. I set the date for the singularity, representing a profound and disruptive transformation in human capability as 2045. The non-biological intelligence created in that year will be one billion times more powerful than all human intelligence today. Singularity originally is a concept of cosmology. Walter Penrose and Stephen Hawking in 1970 uh, elaborated this concept and it describes cosmic moments without any temporal or spatial extension. So at the uh, beginning of the universe at the Big Bang, we had a, the original singularity in the center of black holes. There are singularities to be found. And in this theory of black holes, uh, another concept is introduced, the event horizon. It describes a boundary beyond which no observations and predictions are possible anymore. Throughout the late 1970s, we may observe a broad vulgarization and mystification of black holes, such as in Dis the Disney movie, The Black Hole of 1979. And then only a few years later, Werner Vinge, a science fiction author, adapts the idea of the singularity as a, now a technological singularity. So a disruptive moment in technological development of humankind. Frank Tipler now refers to both semantic layers of singularity. Together with the um, cosmologist John D. Barrow in 1986, he develops the idea of the final anthropic principle. I cannot go into the details here, but the result is very clear. First, they observe it is no accident that life on Earth emerged. 
And if it is no accident, then humanity, so life on Earth, has a task to fulfill. And as they also uh, prove by their calculations that there's no other intelligent life in the whole universe, the task, the goal of intelligent life on Earth is to save the whole universe. And this is only possible when intelligent uh, robots colonize the whole universe. And in the end, all the development of the whole universe will end up again in a final singularity. And this is identical with God and God Omega. This idea uh, refers to the Jesuit philosopher and paleontologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. So the idea here of Frank Tipler is that we have an initial Big Bang singularity. Here we are on the Earth. From here, intelligent life begins to spread and colonize the whole universe, and then in the end finishes in the divine point Omega. So what are the characteristics of the singularity? It's outside, according to Tripler, outside the natural world. It is beyond the natural, natural world. And it is transcendent to the natural world. So approaching the singularity, the amount of information, the amount of knowledge is approaching infinity as you're going into the final state. Or according to Ray Kurzweil, the singularity will allow us to transcend these limitations of our biological bodies and brains. We will gain power over our fates. Our mortality will be in our own hands. By the end of the century, the non-biological portion of our intelligence will be, no, not billions, but trillions of trillions of times more powerful than unaided human intelligence. So how do we contemplate the singularity? As with the sun, it's hard to look at directly. It's better so quint at it out of the corner of your eyes. Just as we find it hard to see beyond the event horizon of a black hole, we also find it difficult to see beyond the event horizon of the singularity. And this, again, is a, is a metaphor so to, to not being able to look at it directly is a metaphor from Christian mysticism introduced by Anselm of Canterbury, who compares God to the sun, and you cannot look into it directly. So where's God in the reasoning of Ray Kurzweil? Here, this is a fictive, um, fictional um, conversation in this book. Right? Once we saturate the matter and energy in the universe with intelligence, it will wake up, be conscious, and sublimely intelligent. That's about as close to God as I can imagine. That's going to be silicon intelligence, not biological intelligence, said Bill. Ray, well, yes, we are going to transcend biological intelligence. So here, the colonization of the whole cosmos, according to Tipler, Kurzweil, Moravec, and many others, is fused into one concept of emergence of merging together the semantics of a, the cosmological and the technological singularity. Only then humanity, so intelligent life, the only intelligent life in the cosmos will be able to prevent the final heat death of the universe, so called entropy. And in the end, colonizing, civilizing the whole cosmos is the same as realizing God as the total of all knowledge or the so-called ultimate computer. If we go back into cultural history, we easily can see that here are many metaphors, symbols, and narratives reflected, which we well know 
at least from the US American history of civilization. Of course, the event horizon reflects the Western frontier, the colonization of America. And the overall idea of colonizing the whole cosmos can be traced back to the so-called manifest destiny and civilizing and also Christianize the West here in the US history. In the 1940s, the leading scientists uh, who, who was very significant for setting up the uh, policy, science policies in the post-war era, Vannevar Bush introduced the metaphor of the endless frontier. Since the geographical frontier is now uh, dissolved in, in the history of colonization or civilization of the US continent, of the American continent, science proves to be a never ending and endless frontier. It, it reflects also the metaphor of the high frontier introduced by the Princeton physicist Gerald O'Neill, who referred to uh, the cosmos, the universe, the conquest of the cosmos as the high frontier. And then this mixture of mysticism and black holes and the universe uh, is again vulgarized in Star Trek movies like The Final Frontier, where Captain Kirk and his team is looking, of course, for God behind the final frontier. And in a very broad sense, of course, we can see also Christian motives, aspects of Christian eschatology here. So the first, the idea that age, DG, disease, and death are overcome, are overcome after the second coming of the Christ and after humanity has been sacrificed. The last idea which became central is then that of the transcendent super intelligence, mainly introduced into the transhumanist discourse here by Nick Bostrom, who was a, um, the founder of the World Transhumanist Association and for many years its president. Now since 2008, he's the founder and director of the Humanity, Future of Humanity Institute. And he became very famous with his book on the dangers of superintelligence of 2014. But here in his promise of the superintelligence, we see the same attributes uh, that are linked also to the singularity. Now, it is hard to think of any problem that a superintelligence could not either solve or at least help us to solve. Disease, poverty, environmental destruction, unnecessary suffering of all kinds. Additionally, a superintelligence could give us indefinite lifespan, either by stopping and reversing the aging process through the use of nanomedicine or by offering us the option to upload ourselves. So the idea of singularity and the superintelligence merge together. Now I come to the end, so the contextualization of this idea of superintelligence, it is also remarkable that they speak only of the one superintelligence, only in the singular. When I read their scriptures, their, their works, one element was quite striking. They used quite often, often um, comparisons like man relates to super in, the coming superintelligence as goldfish, rocks, bacteria, dogs, monkeys, Neanderthals would compare to man. And since I, I work also on, on racism in the 19th century, these metaphors were quite familiar for me because that were exactly the metaphors used by 19th century race theories. They are European, the European genius, for example, Darwin or Michelangelo, were compared with the ape-like 
primitives, especially in the area surrounding the American Civil War, where many scientists were seeking ways of legitimating slavery for their purposes. Here, 19th century and in transhumanism, we can observe also a certain focus on brains, so that are only brains which should be uploaded, and then racist phrenology, so the science of measuring uh, the, the human brain and the human skull, was used to prove the inferior, inferiority of women and of non-white races. In the end, of course, uh, to prevent women and non-white races from having political rights or, or their, the end of slavery. And so I wouldn't state that transhumanists are racists, but I would state that there's a certain persistence of these eugenic interpretations of intelligence in post and transhumanism. And if you join their gatherings, their, their congresses, it's quite striking that, for example, when I was in, in London, we had about 300 participants there. Among them, maybe three women and no um, ethnic diversity. And whenever you, you, are, you meet such a movement, uh, it, it provokes some, some questions, and maybe people of color are a little bit more sensitive, uh, and women, of course, to these um, reasonings here, persistent and trans and post humanism. So, to conclude, I will just quote because it's so nicely um, an excerpt from. Uh, cyberpunk literature, the novel Accelerando by Charles Stross. And the last sentence puts everything together nicely. It's not happening yet, contributes Boris, so the two heroes of the story. Singularity implies infinite rate of change achieved momentarily. Future not amenable thereafter to prediction by pre singularity beings, right? So has not happened. Singularity is a lot of religious junk, Christian mystic rapture recycled for atheist nerds. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver, for your very interesting presentation. Um, I can now open the floor uh, for the discussion. So if ever anyone has um, any question or comment, please just write so in the in the in the chat and I will then give you the floor. Okay, Boris. So yeah, maybe I can just start. Um, great. Uh, th that was really interesting. Um, I have loads of questions. I will just um, ask two of them, uh, very small questions. Uh, first one is, um, as you mentioned, um, a, a line or as you uh, uh, envisaged a line of critique of transhumanism in terms of, let's say, post-colonial studies, let's call it like that towards the end of your of your presentation is there a um uh so far in the literature a sustained critique of transhumanism from uh, let's say femi from feminist side from the feminist side or uh post colonial studies or um or is this completely new this was the first question very briefly the second is um uh transhumanists when they are explicitly asked what they think about religion. Yeah, they, they usually are very uh, ambiguous. I mean, in the sense, some of them say, look, this is not religion, this is science, which of course it's not, uh, as you may make very clear, it's more speculation. Uh, and But others, and I think even Kurzweil 
um, they play with the idea of, of religion and spirituality in the sense that they say, yeah, we should make this into a new religion. We should, uh, transhumanism has, um, uh, uh, stands in need of a kind of uh, uh, spiritual movement that backs backs up the the uh, the, um, the the, uh, the the progress here. So these are the two questions. Um, what, what, what do you think? No. So the question, the second question is, what do you think about these um, explicit statements about religion and spirituality by transhumanists? Yeah. So for for the first question, the critique on the on all these these visions. Yes, I would say this is the critical post-humanism. Mm. It's mainly supported by feminist thinkers, many of them linked to post-colonial theories. And that, that that became so clear for me only in, in my second book when in from 2016 to 19 I reworked my my first book and then in around the year 2000 thinkers like Donna Haraway were also labeled post-humanists but even there uh, it, it was quite visible that she meant something different than my technological thinkers but it was not so clear to differ the two movements and now I would say the critical post-humanism is the total opposite of the technological post-humanism. The, the idea of man, so explicitly, of course, also the male man, the male human being, which is idealized here by my post-humanist thinkers in figures like Sherlock Holmes. So Sherlock Holmes is, is mentioned in all their works as the ideal human being. And it's, it's so bizarre because if you really have read uh, Conan Doyle's stories, Sherlock Holmes has no friends, he has no family. And okay, he's, he's very smart, but what kind of, of hero, in, of genius hero is he really? And so the, the critical posthumanism, of course, criticizes all these single elements but there's no direct con conversation between the two. Um, usually cultural or scholars in cultural studies don't deal so much with technological ideas, visions and theories of progress. Mm. So it's up to us, to you. Um, you are in between the two disciplines or, or areas of disciplines. The second question, in how, in how far could we consider transhumanists as being religious? Um, I would encourage to pose another question, not to pose, are they religious or, or is transhumanism a kind of religion or not, but to look, what are they doing with religion? If you talk with nearly all of the transhumanists, and I would even include Frank Tipler, um, they would say, no, we are scientists, we are atheists, we are very materialist in, in our approaches. But they do a lot with religious ideas and theories and elements. But I would regard it to, or consider it to be quite difficult if they strongly resist. I can recount only my participation in one of their congresses. I was a PhD student in religious studies, Religionswissenschaft, and when I introduced me to, to my counterparts there, everyone wondered, who oh, religious studies, why that? Is there still religion in the world? So that's, that's their thinking. And also a very 19th century idea of religion. If the problem of death is solved, and that will be soon be solved by these visions, then we don't need religion anymore. So it's very much in, in a 
a 19th century criticism of, of religion like Feuerbach, for example. And, but if we turn the question around and look, okay, what, what idea of God do they have here? Um, where does that come from? Especially with Frank Tipler, that's so fascinating how he on the one hand receives the, the ideas of Teilhard de Chardin, and on the other hand of the founder of natural theology, that was William Pelley in about 1800. There he published his, his major works to see, to, to scrutinize the creation, scrutinize the cosmos, and then make an argument of it. So creation is not accidental, and we have a task, a goal to solve. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Now we have another question from uh, Arka Prava. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say, uh, sir, it was a fascinating session and uh, I was greatly inspired. Uh, sir, I had actually two questions. Uh, so uh, firstly, I would like to ask that in regards to uh, technological post-humanism, we can see there's already a lot of um, organ transplant and such kind of technology being used to uh, help the human body survive at this point. So uh, perhaps this could be taken like a situation which is like the ship of thesis uh, that Heraclitus and uh, Plato had uh, spoken of uh, from a philosophical standpoint. So, uh, so eventually when a person becomes uh, a trans, suppose uh, after he dies, it, does it solve the question of death if uh, technology actually replaces the human being itself? Because uh, even uh, philosophers like Rene Descartes, they would also suggest that I think, therefore I am. And uh, it's also there in Hinduism as we are part of the whole uh, universe and we must, and only a soul can transcend. So uh, does uh, technological post-humanism actually uh, solve the question of death? So that is my yes. first. So uh, would I also ask my second question now, or should I? Oh, maybe maybe the second later. Then I can answer directly because this question was very complex. Uh, yeah, um, the the idea of human identity is rooted rooted in cybernetic theory of the 1950s, and that means the so-called pattern of identity theory. So if you are able to reconstruct the materialist pattern of the human being on the atomic scale, then you are able to simulate, or they speak of an emulation uh, of the whole identity. And what is interesting, they do not aim to simulate the whole body, but only the brain. Although we know that in the past 50 years, brain uh, research has, has proven that human identity is far more than only the, the brain in, in, our, uh, in our sky. So th this would be the, the salvation, and it's, it's very simple, simply thought. There does not exist anything like an immaterial soul for them. Right. Second uh, question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, my second question would actually be a continuation of what you just uh, said right now. So, uh, sir, we were talking about transhumanism and how this could lead to a uh, situation of super intelligence, which would lead us to colonize the universe and thus be God. Uh, but, sir, uh, do you think that this is the role of God? to colonize the universe because uh, in various other uh, religions, for example, in Hinduism, uh, in my research, it shows uh, that uh, God is considered to be omnipresent and omniscient. It is a concept uh, that is actually the constant which answers all the uh, technological uh, in inadequacies. For example, a question like uh, if uh, the law of thermodynamics, if uh, if uh, matter cannot be created or destroyed, where did the first matter come from? So whenever we have such questions which cannot be answered, we always go for a constant or we go for a universal, uh, we, we go for a philosophical approach. So 
how can we say that the role of God is to colonize the universe and that would make uh, us God? Because transhumanism can also be looked yeah. at from you know, Spinoza's perspective, uh, where the mind is away from uh, different from the body. If you if you look at, into it from a monistic approach, perhaps, and there are various other such schools of thought. So I thought that this could also be a question in, of relevance here, sir. Yeah. So so my answer will will point to two aspects. The first aspect is the the logics of this posthumanist thought. As, as I explained to you, they, they really fight hard to prove that we are the only intelligent beings in the whole cosmos. And therefore, we have to fulfill this task to save the universe from the uh, prospect of the heat death. And therefore, because we have this task, the singularity must happen. So the technological singularity in 30 years. So this is a circular, circular argument for them. It's, it's not a, 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 an argument a priori. It's an argument that, that uh, an, a, a kind of legitimization of a technological imperative we really have to develop super intelligences that save the universe because it is up to us and this is why it has to happen there's no alternative in their thinking this is the first layer the second layer of of my answer points to the idea of god here and um in the in the late 19th century and especially in the 20th century, there were several thinkers who developed a new idea of God. First, in Christian theology to the 18th century, God was an eternal, unchanging being. And when the idea was developed in the 19th century that life, that earth, that intelligence was developing, also the idea arose that God also is something to be developed, that there's an alpha, a God in the beginning, and an omega in the end of the development. Thinkers like Samuel Alexander, and most famously, Alfred North Whitehead, and then the mentioned Teilhard de Chardin played a crucial role here. So this is the, the idea of God they follow. God has to be developed, and humanity plays a role here to develop God. So that's quite different than, than in Hindu mythology. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it, it definitely is. I, I think uh, the, uh, you have definitely been able to give me an uh, insight in this regard. So uh, just a follow up to this. Uh, uh, so in regards to Hinduism and also in Christianity, we have the concept of uh, uh, the soul transcending and uh, a new life maybe uh, that is born out of death and uh, so uh, in that regard if if uh, there is a singularity that is achieved wouldn't this cycle be uh, dismantled altogether of uh, rebirth and uh, so uh, where, so how do we justify uh, that the earth in order for it to move on there must be the old order must change giving way to the new how how would you say that so should technology uh, yeah it's, it's very it's very simple um because when human beings and following the prognosis of Kurzweil for example he says in the end of this century so in the year 2099 there will be hardly any biological human beings left all others will be integrated into storages of computers why? Because then we share everything the superintelligence has. So omniscience, omnipotence, they have very plastic ideas of, of virtual playmates, of eternal sex, and things like that. Very material fantasies there, too. And Thank so you. That would be the answer. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Akaprava, for your uh, questions. Um, now we have three more um, questions. Um, I'm afraid there might not be time to, to get more questions after these three, but let's see how we, we get on. So the first one is from Christian. Christian, are you there? Uh, maybe we can... Um, okay, all right, no problem. Um, then, uh, Blazenka, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Blazenka Scheuer from Lund University in Sweden. Uh, I, I, you mentioned several times that the, the concept of salvation, uh, we need to, to save the universe. Uh, and I didn't catch really what the universe needs to be saved from. Yeah, that's a that's an idea in, um, developed in late 19th century by Helmholtz and other physicists that in the end of the universe, when all energy differences are equalized, then there's the so-called heat death, which is actually a, a freeze death of the universe. And so that has to be overcome uh, by technology in the vision of our posthumanist thinkers. Some imagine a huge mirror between the energy differences are mirrored again and again, but it's Okay, it's sounds nice. complicated. I, yeah. I was just, I heard today the Nobel laureate in, in physics, uh, Roger Penrose. Penrose, uh, yeah. Is he one of, <laughs> he's not one of these people, I suppose, because no, no, he, no. He, he says that the Big Bang is going to not to be a beginning of the universe, but the end of it. So, yeah. so it, there are it, different, there are different theories of, okay. of or okay. on the end of the, of the yeah. cosmos. Yeah. But okay. that gets beyond my competences. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for a very enlightening lecture. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I think we have... Uh, Lucia, did you have a comment or a question? Because I think I saw your hand. Yeah. A little question, just a little question. I am wondering if beyond this idea of... Uh, singularity there is not a form of uh, technologically based uh, political theology it means that there are there is a lot of potential for for uh, uh, something similar to the concepts that in political theology have been discussed so I, I am wondering if there are in your opinion connections or it can be relevant as a political theology itself the the singularity theory yeah we we can see it even directly their policy making is in the future of humanity institute uh, the agenda in the beginning was to make the transhumanist ideas more popular in the beginning they it was a movement of a few thousand people all over the world, which died out shortly in the 2000, late 2000 years. So the next idea was to uh, found a couple of institutes and this one, the Institute of the, for the Future of Humanity was the most successful. And they, they are advisors for uh, policy making in, in Great Britain. In US, there were also attempts to to be included in policy making but uh, that did not succeed so much so and in a broader sense yes uh, i think i i wouldn't claim that if our politicians uh, are repeating now the call for developing super intelligence um, and um to to promote artificial intelligence usage in in the new digital economy, that this is a posthumanist agenda, but the posthumanists are maybe the most extreme utopians in, in this area, with which which get a, a which get a huge audience uh, with this idea. And uh, they are which is troubling me most is that their agenda is maybe quite naive. And if you if you follow the cyberpunk literature or movies on these topics, they're much more critical. They ask, okay, imagine we will have something like that. 
what are the economic consequences of that on society? Uh, what are the ecological consequences of it? And, and things like that. But we don't see that at all in the post-humanist debate. We only see that negotiated, for example, in science fiction uh, literature. So, and so I, I think uh, the, there's a certain danger in, in their very optimistic way of promoting their, their far-reached uh, goals here. Thank you, Lucia, for your question and for your for your answer. Um, actually, we still have uh, yeah four minutes, so maybe if, if someone else um, has any comments or questions, we still have time to to take it. Um, otherwise, I could uh, Boris, do you have yeah, just very briefly because there was one. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because you mentioned just now one thing that I was wondering about for. Uh, 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 since, ever since I uh, uh, read about transhumanism, has any transhumanist considered, let's say, the 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 costs of development of such a super intelligence or whatever in terms of energy consumption? Is 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 there anything? Because that, I was always thinking, yeah, right, um, great, great, uh, great fantasies about great technologies, but but what about? Where's the energy supposed to come from for 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 powering these no. kinds of, of extreme technologies? So, no, and and even in a, in a more basic aspect, that for scientific progress, it is needed that we have science infrastructure, that we have a certain economic stability, and a society a, a politics that want progress in, in this sense, all these aspects are widely ignored here in the post-humanist debate. I guess they absolutely don't want to enter these discussions because then they have to enter the whole discussion. So what are the ideals they aim for? What idea of human beings, what idea of solidarity are behind that. And I think that they don't want to have this discussion. Maybe it's a characteristic of these far reaching um, utopias that they never want to have two earthly discussions. Yeah. Otherwise, they, they don't function. Thank you. Um. Yeah, Margarita, you want to add something or? Well, um, maybe like a very, very final, quick question. So, um, post humanists don't really engage too much with existing um, research on AI, but they rather uh, engage more on speculations. Um, so, my question is so, speculations about what can or should be achieved with uh, technology, including AI. So, my question is, how helpful do you think these speculations might actually be also for policy making? So do you think they may be somehow useful also for the development and the regulation of AI technologies? No, not directly. I think um, we have to acknowledge that to, to see future as a resource, as an economic resource, and in some way they sell the future. On the Congresses, they uh, organized like the um, Rodfest, the rebellion against aging and death. The Californian Congress started, I think, four years ago, so it's annually. Uh, they promote on a very small scale vitamin pills. So live long enough to live forever. Ray Kurzweil is writing also since the 1990s so called life help books for having a long life. So maybe uh, mainly it's really on, on selling vitamin pills here. But on a large scale, uh, what the um, Singularity University is organizing these summits all over the world is to promote disruptive economic, economical or technological innovations. And disruptive means ideas that will affect 
at least one billion people on this planet. And so they under the term singularity, which absolutely don't play a role in promoting technologies, but under this term, it's it's a kind of establishing a marketplace for selling the future. And selling the future means to attract um, investments for future businesses, mainly in, in digital technology, but uh, in many other areas as well. So in this year, I, I would underline it's it's nothing to be underestimated. That it's really a part, a very effective part of selling the future. Thank you, thank you very much, Oliver, for your for your answers and for your very very fascinating um, presentation. Boris, back to you. Um, yes. Uh... My, yeah, it's it's switched on. So, um, Oliver, thank you very much. I, I see now another raised hand by Kate uh, Timone, but uh, I'm afraid we have to close the meeting uh, for today. So my apologies for this. Um, uh, Oliver, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who listened and uh or participated in the in our discussions. Uh, please let me uh, remind you that we will now have a well a one month break uh, in our webinar series. So the next the next webinar will take place um, in January. Um, that is on Wednesday, January January the thirteenth of twenty one, uh, and our speaker will be Robert Gerachi. He will be talking about technological give and take, religions of AI and in Indian science and engineering. So we will have another session on broadly transhumanist um, uh, topics. Thank you very much again, and uh, hope to see you again in January. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much.